going to real life? You good? Y'all glad to be at church? Glad snow fell? Glad it's done? Yeah, thank God for weathermen, huh? They're the demise of church attendance across the nation. Uh, we, uh, we're so thankful that you're here. We're thankful that you're safe. For those of you that are watching online, whether, you, uh, whether you're watching this service or going to watch later on, we're thankful that you're safe. Hopefully you stayed home and snuggled up with some hot chocolate on a fire and, and put us on your TV and made everybody in the house watch. Uh, that's what I hope today. But uh, we're glad that you guys are here this morning as we are uh, continuing in our series called The Year of the Bible. Uh, I'm going to be in Mark chapter 7. If you have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn there and get ready for that. But uh, we're excited that you were here. Uh, it's been an interesting week. Uh, and, and more things to come, I think good things to come for our church. I want to I kind of tease you a little bit, if that's okay. Uh, March 17th, everybody say March 17th. March 17th. You need to be here, okay? That's the tease. All right, no, I was kidding. Um, I also need, if you haven't signed up for baptism, and you know that's your next step, please go do that and be back here, or do that at the Life Connect counter as you leave today. And that way we can kind of get you set up, get you ready to go, ready to roll for baptism. We're going to be doing that on the 17th, but we've got a whole bunch of other stuff that we got planned for the 17th that I can't wait to share. So be watching on Facebook. I'll be giving the full announcement next week, and so that way you'll be ready for it. But how many of you are glad it's March? Say amen. Woo! We're starting almost the second quarter of this year already. Uh, in a week, five, six days from now, I turn 43 years old. Woo! No, in, in a week, a week, I turned 43, and I'm excited about it because it means I get to turn 43. I had a friend of mine this week, uh, is, uh, he helped us start Real Life Church, his name was Robbie Burning, and a uh, good friend of mine, and earlier this week, uh, he had a heart attack, and a bad one, and we were talking about it, and he said, and he's my age, and so uh, we were talking about it, he said, you know, it's amazing how real things get. He said, when I looked up at the EMT and I just asked, am I going to die? And the EMT paused. He said, it gets very, very real, very fast. And, uh, and I'm just so thankful. And if you have health and you have friends and family and support and you have all of those things, be very thankful for what God has given you. Amen? Because it can quickly be taken away. And, and this life is full of trouble. The Word tells us that. And I, I did a funeral yesterday for a young man. He was 34 years old. And uh, that scripture in Psalms chapter 90 continually, Lord, teach us to number our days. Teach us to take account of every day that we have. And Lord, what are we doing in that day that is valuable to you or to the kingdom of God? And so that's kind of where we're going to end up leaning towards today. Mark chapter 7. You read, if you're reading along with the church, you read this on, I believe it was Monday. And you've got Jesus kind of, he showed up, and now he's kind of walking around in the midst of his ministry, and the Pharisees are not fans of Jesus, and so the Pharisees are kind of watching Jesus. They're watching him all the time. Now, among the Pharisees, there was another council. It was the council of the elders, and so you had Pharisees, but then you had like the Pharisees of Pharisees. And these guys were the ones that originally instituted the 500 additional laws to what God had instituted in the book of Leviticus and Exodus. And, and as we read through all those laws that we're reading through right now, how many of you are still enjoying Leviticus? You're almost there, all right? You're going to make it. But they added 500 plus new laws to what God had already said. And so this crew had kind of made this whole thing about hand washing pretty severe. And so Jesus is teaching one day and the Pharisees are there. And the Pharisees roll up and they go, Jesus! We have perceived that your disciples don't wash their hands properly. Now, how many of you, if you get a chance to ask Jesus a question, if you have a moment with the Savior, they had already seen miracles occur in Jesus' life. They would seen the sick healed, the lame walking, the blind seeing, the dead rising, the multitudes fed. They had seen things like this, and the question they come up with is, why aren't they washing their hands? It seems a little shallow, right? I hope that if you and I, or when you and I get to see Jesus face to face, if you have a question for him, it is not about the hand washing principles that you encountered here on earth, but that's what they ask him. And so Jesus goes into this passage that we're going to read today in Mark chapter 7. 
It's a familiar passage for those of you that have read Scripture, or at least you've heard some semblance of this that I'm going to read to you today. And we're going to get into this idea of what it looks like. But we're going to talk today about the heart. How many of you know the heart's pretty important? Say amen. There's a medical term, and, and some of you could probably correct me on this, but I was reading something this week, and they said when the heart dies, that's pretty much it. That's a good medical journal, huh? But how many of you know that if the heart's not doing anything, it doesn't really matter how healthy the rest of your body is? You can be amazing. You can be an Olympic athlete. And if your heart dies, it doesn't matter how fast you can run the mile, how high you can jump, or how far you can run. You're just done if your heart dies. It's a pretty central organ. It's pretty important to what we are. Well, let me just tell you, it is extremely similar in your spiritual life. The heart of man is something that is crucial. In fact, I will tell you that every way that you respond, that you react, any way that you give feedback, any way that you process and ask or a or request, all of those answers come from your heart. The Bible says in one scripture, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what comes out of your mouth is actually coming from your heart. You say, I don't know, Vince, sometimes I say some bad things. Well, then you probably ought to check your heart. And that's what Jesus goes into with these Pharisees, because they start bringing up this thing about hand washing. And so in verse 14, Jesus picks up and he says this. And he called the people to him and again, he said this, hear me. He's getting everybody close. And when Jesus says, hear me, in Mark chapter 7, verse 14, he wants to make sure he's getting everybody close. Hear me, all of you, and understand what I'm saying. I'm about to drop some knowledge on you. I'm about to give you something that's pretty important for you Jewish people to hear. And I would say this today. I think God wants to give those of us that are here something pretty important. If you call yourself Christian, if you call yourself believer, if you know that you're a child of God, then today's message is pretty important because it deals with the heart. And Jesus, just like then, is now saying, listen close. Listen close. He says this, verse 15, there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. The things that come out of you are what defile you. Now, he said that, and everybody kind of looked there quizzically at him. And later on, the disciples come to him and go, hey, hey, what you said about things coming out of you and going into you, we didn't quite understand. And so Jesus gets his disciples together, and he breaks it down a little tighter. In verse 20, he says this. Now, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the, what does it say, church? The heart of man come evil thoughts, Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. They all come from your heart. We're, how we react, how we respond, if we're bitter, if we're angry, if we're unforgiving, whatever it might be, those are all heart conditions. If you're a joyful person, if your first response is joy, I know most of, if you run into a person whose first response is joy, how many of you somewhere deep down in your heart you'd like to punch them in the throat? You know what I'm talking about? I mean, no one, like they rode a unicorn to work happy, like that kind of happy and you're like, ah, I just want to choke you out right now if I could because I, so, most of us don't function at that level. We have other things that are in our heart kind of overtake that. We have some places in our heart that we've been hurt in the past and, and the shrapnel of past wounds. Maybe you've been abused and you've got some shrapnel that's still in your heart that causes a block. Maybe, maybe you've been neglected. Maybe you've been left abandoned. Maybe, maybe somebody hurt you bad and you've got these, this block in your heart that your responses still come out of that. Your relationships continue to destroy themselves because of this thing that happened to your heart. Wonder, what am I going to do? Because now I've got this banged up heart. And yet God continually cries for my heart to be right and I don't know how to make it right. Because we have broken hearts. We live in a society where most people are damaged in some way, shape, or form, especially their heart. And so as we go through this today, I want to try to give you four things. I'm going to try to do them pretty quick if I can get through them. But as we go through them, 
I want you to kind of take some mental notes. These are some things that God wants you to do with your heart or that God wants to do with your heart. Because both are important. First thing that you got to do, you and I, the first thing we have to do with our heart that God has given us is guard our heart. Everybody say, guard your heart. We guard our heart. You say, oh, it's easy for me to do. What does that mean for me to do? This is what it says in Proverbs. Guard your heart above all else. Above all else, above everything else, guard your heart. For it determines the course of your life. Your heart determines the direction in which you will go. So it's pretty important that you guard it. It's pretty important that you take real concern into what's going into it. I was writing stuff down this morning. I was like, God wants you to guard his heart like a teenager guards their phone. How many of you ever tried to take a phone from a teenager? They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, I mean, give me your phone. Which phone? Your phone. My phone? Your phone. Give me your phone. Hey, you got a passcode on your phone. What's the passcode? I don't remember. It's your phone. I know. It's, I forgot it. I don't know what it is. I can't remember what it is. Is it your birthday? No. No? Well, it's got a fingerprint. Go ahead and put your fingerprint on there. They put their fingerprint on there because it didn't work. It doesn't work. I, I don't guess it works. Oh, maybe it's not my phone. That's because they use their elbow instead of their finger, and that's how they get in their phone. Some of you parents are like, oh, I just figured it out. It's amazing how much they guard it because they don't want you to have that information. They feel like it's their information. Well, the reality of guarding your heart is the same way that God is going, man, I've given you something great, this heart of Christ. At salvation, I gave you this new heart, and I want you to guard it. I want you to protect it. I don't want you to let any garbage come in at it. And yet, yet we struggle. You say, well, yeah, but Vince, you know, guarding your heart, what does that really mean? Let me just kind of give you this. How many of you ever bought a new car? How many of you, when you bought that new car, you were really concerned about where you parked at Walmart? Right? You will walk 27 miles to the front door of Walmart so nobody jacks with your car. Right? You don't want to bang. Oh, no. Now you got this little black mark on your car because somebody that's in a 1976 Volkswagen beat up piece of junk, you're like, why'd you have to park next to my car? You park it out here because it's new and you want it to stay new and you protect it. But after time, you then you like sliding into handicap spots illegally. I see you. I know. And if I don't, God does. So you need to stop it. All right. But you park, you park anywhere because the new has wore off. Guys, Christians, we have to be cautious of this because as believers, sometimes the new wears off. And we don't guard like we once did. And God's going, guard this heart because it's a heart I have put in you. And it's something I want you to protect. And so you've got to keep the influences out of there. If something is leading you down a path that you don't need, then you need to be guarding against it. Guard against temptation. Well, Vince, I'm going to be tempted. When I was younger, I can't remember how old I was. I think I was maybe about five. And Dad's in this service, so he can maybe correct me. But I think I was about five. I walked in the house, and I had been outside. And I walked in, and there had been a bird that flew over that had tremendous aim. And this bird went to the bathroom right on my head. You weren't there. It's not that funny, Susan. All right? It, it went to the bathroom right on my head, and I come in, and it's leaked down my forehead, and it crossed my nose. And I came in, and I told my dad, the stinking bird cracked all over my head because I didn't know the difference in the words. And I can remember that moment because I remember him preaching about it. That's what happens when you're a preacher's kid. You get infused in every sermon that there is. My children know. But I can remember the lesson that he always used because it was about temptation. And about this reality that you can have temptation that comes and it shows up in your life because here's the reality. You will be tempted. It's coming. You will be tempted. But the temptation is yours to either shoo away and not submit to or to embrace and keep and fall to. And so with the bird analogy, he said, oh, he was always telling me, he said, hey, there's going to be a, a bird may land on your head, but you have the ability to shoo it away so it doesn't stay there. So it doesn't just make a nest. You want it to go away. Temptation's the same way. Well, what is that? That's guarding your heart. That's knowing that certain situations, certain relationships you probably don't need to have, so don't have them. But I don't want to be that guy. No, really, your heart is that important. Be that guy. 
that you will protect and you will guard this heart that God has given you. I want to give you this quote because I think that sometimes we misunderstand this idea in regards to guarding. What God begins at the moment of salvation isn't complete in the same moment. Now, God saves you when you say, Jesus Christ, forgive me, I'm a sinner, I believe you're the Son of God, and I want you to come into my life. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, then you shall be saved. But you are not done. God didn't save you to leave you. He saved you so that you would grow. Here's what this says. You say, well, I don't know, Vince, I'm saved. I'm good. I shouldn't have to do anything else. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. How many of you know Jesus Christ hasn't returned yet? Then we aren't done. He's still doing the work in me, and I've still got to let him. That means I've got to guard against the temptation and the sin that comes at me so that God can continue to grow and to fill me. So we got to guard our heart, but we got to grow our heart also. Are you still gossiping as a Christian? Are you still bitter? Still holding a grudge? You still mad about it? You still unhappy when someone else succeeds? You still see that person, and when you walk by the thoughts in your head, it's probably really good that they're not verbal. Because it would be sin. Let me just go ahead and clear that up for you. Whether they're verbal or not, it's still sin. And so we ought to be growing our heart. We ought to be taking our heart from where it is and growing it to something greater. The problem with growing it stinks, and that takes some work. And we don't like work. We're just not fans of it. Most people are not fans of it. You say, well, I, like, I don't mind a good day's hard work. That's fine. I'm talking about spiritual work. We don't like it because it takes a toll. And I know we live in this culture that says we've got to have everything right now. We've got to have it right now. I read some statistics this week. Um, 0.05% of Americans. Everybody got that number? 0.05% of Americans are millionaires. Okay. In a poll, recent poll that was taken, 80% of Americans believe they're going to be millionaires at some point or another. 80% believe at some point or another they're going to be millionaires. But in reality, 0.05% are actually millionaires. We have a math problem in our country. Okay? And I don't think math is the real problem. Unreal expectations is the real problem because we're waiting to get lucky. We're waiting for Powerball to call us. We're waiting for that dude from Publishers Clearinghouse to walk up with that big old fat check. We've bought magazines. We've got more than we know what to do with. But he's coming with the balloons in the Astro Van. He's going to show up because it's going to happen to me, and I'm going to jump into that because I'm going to be this. And you have this expectation of this. Man, it's going to take a little bit of work. It's going to take a divine accident. But one of these days, I'm going to get there. I don't, want you to ha- I don't want you to not have drive. Understand. But here's what drive does. Drive goes to work. Spiritually, as believers, you got saved. And if you're just waiting for God to endow you with all kinds of amazing wisdom and discernment and the ability to impart scriptures to people around you, you're going to be disappointed if you don't pick up your Bible. You're not going to know how to walk through the trials of this life. You're not going to know how to fix your marriage when it falls apart. You're not going to know how. If you don't begin to grow this within you. I love this example of this. And, and Kevin was in the first service with us. But I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I, Adam said we have the picture now. Kevin, you guys, some of you guys know Kevin. Uh, Kevin is one of our drummers here at the church. Okay. The drumsticks look really small in his hands, all right? But he is one of our drummers here, and and I love Kevin to death. Kevin and I have known each other for nearly 30 years. It's weird saying that out loud, okay? But we've known each other that long. We're good friends. We graduated school together. But let me tell you something. When Kevin was in school, when we graduated, I believe Kevin told me he weighed somewhere around 140 to 150 pounds as a senior in high school. 
Okay? Very different than this Kevin. But I'm going to tell you something about that Kevin. That Kevin didn't roll up into a gym and go, hey, come on, muscles. Let's do this thing. Nope. Kevin walked into a gym. He picked up weight. And then the next day, he walked into the gym and he picked up weight. And then the next day, he picked up weight. And he picked up weight. And he picked up weight. And 30 years later, this picture was taken last year. So 30 years later, he's here. Listen to me about spiritual growth, folks. Spiritual growth is not automatic, it's systematic. And if you don't apply a system to growth in your life, then how far are you really from who you once were? See, if, if God saved me and I'm here and I haven't grown any to get to here, I'm not too awful far from what I once was. Last week when Jennifer and I got off that airplane on Saturday, or on Friday, I got, we got on the airplane in Orlando, Florida. It was 89 degrees and sunny. I got off the plane in Little Rock. It was 40 degrees, foggy and drizzly. And I lost my keys at the airport. It's a bad day. I got off the plane, and I looked back at the gate, and the gate said, departing for Orlando, Florida in one hour. I was like, do, 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 do. I was heading back. Jennifer's like, no, 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 no. You see, I was so close that it would have been easy for me to get back on the airplane. The further I got away from the gate, the more I realized this is where I'm at. This is what I got to do. All right, I'm going to have to get my coat out of my suitcase. I'm going to have to get prepared because I'm getting further away from where I was. Guys, in your spiritual life, if you're not growing, you're not very far away from what you once were. And it will be easy for you to go back. So you have to grow this spiritual heart of yours, this heart that God has said, guard it and grow it. Then the third thing he wants you to do is this. Let me give you the scripture in Ephesians. Sorry, sorry. Ephesians chapter 4 says this. We are not meant to remain as children. We're not meant to remain as children, but to grow up in every way in Christ. Your spiritual maturity, your ability to let things go, your ability to not hold a grudge, your ability to not be bitter, your ability to forgive ought to be growing according to Ephesians chapter 4. We are not to remain as children. Kids hold a grudge on the playground. They take their ball and go home. As adults, we ought not be doing this. Third thing we have to do, not only do we guard it, not only do we grow it, but we better learn to give it away. We have to give away this heart that God gave us. Now, this is the fun part, because if you're guarding and if you're growing, this will be natural. It'll be natural for you to give your heart away. And I I love the idea of giving your heart away. If you're walking in a mature relationship with God, then you're doing this part. It should just be flowing out of you. In every relationship, though, understand this. You are giving something away. In every relationship, there's a part of you that's leaving. My question to you would be, is the part of you that's leaving the part God has grown in your life, or is it still you? Do people see Christ, or do they see you? Because you're giving something away. Let me give you an example of this. How many of you have ever been to the birthday party of a four-year-old boy? How many of you know that at that birthday party, there will be one child possessed by a devil? Maybe not in reality, but you kind of think so, right? Like he's that kid that when you're sitting there and you're watching everything go down, you glance over at the cupcake tray and he's got one and he's twisting it into your carpet and he's looking at you the whole time while he's doing it, like, come at me, bro. He's like daring you to do this and you're trying to stop him, but in the moment that you lunge for him, he's taken off that way and stabbed one of the moms in the leg with a fork and you're like, who is this child? And I know what we think, because we do it in Walmart, too. When somebody's kids are acting a fool, you walk around the next aisle, and you look at your spouse, and you're like, I know what I'd do to that kid if he's my kid. (laughs) My dad used to say stuff like, I'll jerk a knot in your tail. I still have no idea what that means. (laughs) Let me be clear. I still have no desire to know what that means, because he said it with enough authority that I didn't want to know. But we say it, don't we? When we see that kid acting like that, we're like, hmm. Give me 10 minutes with that kid. I'll straighten him right out. 
I wonder if God says the same thing when you lose your mind at McDonald's when they mess up your order. When you get cut off in traffic and you are losing your stuff. Some of you four-letter people out there, you know who you are. Some of you are cussers and you just, you let go of this string that sounds like supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, but it's all swear words in there and you just crammed it all together because that guy cut you off. And God's going, if you give me 10 minutes alone with that guy in a room, I'll straighten him out. Because here's the thing, you're giving something away constantly. The question becomes, what are you giving away? It's what comes out of the heart that defiles the man. I wonder if what comes out of the heart can defile the man. I wonder if what comes out of the heart also defines the man. If that's the case, what is defining you? How do people define you? Is it an angry person? Or he's mad all the time, just snaps and just bleh, all the time, just comes out. Is that how you're being defined? Then it's a heart issue that you have to fix. It's a heart issue that you have to fix. It's not anybody's fault. Stop blaming the world. They didn't do it. It's you. It's you. Well, Vince, you don't know the hurt. I didn't say you weren't hurt. I'm saying your response is you. Some of you probably need to talk to somebody about getting your heart fixed. The broken pieces where the shrapnel of your past is still dug deep into it. But if we're not giving it away, we've got to make sure that we're giving the right heart away. The only way to give the right heart away is for it to replace. The right heart has to replace our old heart. It's the only way that it happens. We see this idea. God loves, I love this about God. God loves me, and he still loves the demon toddler that I talked about a minute ago. He loves him to death. There are times I think he chuckles. I think when Caleb was in mid-flight off our balcony that day, I think God chuckled. And then I think he moved the sectional perfectly so that Caleb would land in it. Because I think God loves him. And he loves me even in my moments where I lose my mind when I get wronged or feel like I get wronged. I'm learning the more that I study Jesus, there's less things that he is concerned about than I am. As I study Jesus in the Gospels, I start reading and I go, man, God, I don't know what this person thinks or that person thinks. And I don't know what people are going to do. And then I read where Mary comes to Jesus and like, Jesus, I don't know what we're going to do. The wine doesn't have any wedding. And he says, woman, why is this my problem? Oh, A, Jesus, don't talk to your mom like that. B, Mary, God just said, leave him alone. It's not a problem. And I wonder how many times we add problems to our life, and by doing that, we pollute our heart to what God really wants us to be about. What do people think? Jesus said, what does it matter to me? What do you mean, what does it matter to you? Jesus said, no, I'm... I'm I'm here about my father's business. My father's business is to bring the kingdom here, and that's what's happened. I am bringing the kingdom of God here, the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, I got a cross out ahead of me that I know I'm going to get to. So me worrying about what he thinks or she thinks or they think, that's not going to get me to the cross any faster. Why sweat that? Go, oh, wait, wait a minute. Yeah. But Jesus, what about politics? Because God, man, Jesus, you know we're in this Roman thing with the Jewish thing, and it's constantly, con just, it's awful all the time. Jesus, what are we going to do about this? Sound familiar? And Jesus goes, did you not hear me? You see, I got a cross out here ahead of me. You all can argue about this all you want, but it's no concern of mine. Render unto Caesar what Caesar's, because I'm going to the cross. I wonder if we got more passionate about making a difference with the gospel than making a point about our political stance, how much we would do in this country. Here's the reality. All of us have a point. All of us can make a point. Not everybody chooses to make a difference. And that's what the gospel has called you to do. I'm not saying don't be concerned about it. I'm not saying don't vote. I think you should vote. I think God has given us to a place to live and we're blessed to live where we live and you ought to be a part of the process. But whining and complaining and fighting with people about the process, that's a waste of gospel time. You can call it a rant if you want. I'm just reading and seeing what Jesus did when they brought up Caesar to him. He gives him one sentence and then he goes witnesses to a blind man. 
gives him one statement and then he heals a leper. His heart was about something greater. Church, is our heart about something greater? Are we still stuck? This world is not my home. The old song says, I'm just passing through. Something greater for me out here. And so I'm, I'm going to guard my heart. I'm going to grow my heart. But in giving my heart away, I have to make sure that I'm giving something that's worth receiving. And the only time I can do that is if I give Christ. But my stuff matters. Yes, your hurt matters. But at the end of the day, the gospel is greater than all of it. All of it. What are you giving away? This is what the scripture says. Matthew chapter 9 says this. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. That word compassion literally means that his heart went to them. Is your heart going to people? Do you look on the crowds with compassion? Or judgment? What are you giving away? Because it matters. The Bible says this, love the Lord your God in Mark chapter 12, verse 30, 31. It's very familiar. I've said it, I think about every service in this series thus far. Love the Lord your God with all your what? It's first. You get your heart right and your soul and your mind and your strength will follow. But this, this thing that defiles you or defines you comes from your heart, church. We got to get our heart right. We gotta get that part unbroken. We gotta get that part healed. I don't want you to ask God to help you have a good heart. I want you to ask God to heal your broken heart because that's where it will start. Because this is what He promises, and I love this. And I'm gonna jump to the very last verse. I'm not, I'm not even gonna give you the third, fourth point because it doesn't matter. The very last verse is found in Ezekiel. And it says this, and I will give you a new heart. I love this passage. I've probably heard it before, but I don't know if God's just renewing it or reviving it in my heart. I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of who those two words described in the room. If I ask any of you, are you stubborn? Are you bullheaded about change? Are you bullheaded about what God wants you to do? Are you bullheaded about the sin you've allowed in your life? Are you stubborn with it, going, it's not that big a deal? Have you hardened yourself? Has it gotten calloused, some of the things you've allowed in your life, some of the, the ways you talk to your friends, the way you talk to your spouse, the way you talk to your kids, kids, the way you talk to your parents? Have you just gotten used to being that way? Then you need to ask God to remove the stony, stubborn heart that is in you and I will give you a tender responsive heart responsive heart says God what do you want from me God what do you want from me David prayed it Psalms 51 he says hey Lord create in me a clean heart a new heart create in me a new heart God and renew this spirit in me church we got to get our heart right you want your friends and family to go to heaven and not hell because those are the only two options. I know most people, Philip, Pastor Philip and I were talking about this week, the sad part about where we live currently right now is the majority of people all believe that everyone's going to heaven. Some way, shape, or form, whatever heaven they believe in, but they're probably going there. And the reality is that that's not reality. And we've got to get passionate. We've got to get a heart for our loved ones, for our kids, for our neighbors, for our, our, our families and, and co-workers that they're going to go to hell if our heart doesn't change for them. It doesn't change for them. We don't get compassionate where our heart goes out. It's not fair. It's not fair.